Right, welcome to our World Class Contact Centre's Operational Excellence. Um, it's our first virtual session, and uh, please, your input and comments after today will be most welcome. And uh, my colleague, Carrie, is sitting in the background watching the cafe, and uh, will advise us on how we should be developing our learning going forward. Uh, that said, let's uh, just take our first uh, look at what our program will be about. And I'll start with some introductions. I've uh, been you know, quite a lot of people who are registered today, but for those who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, and I have no intention of reading through all that. But as you can see, um, I have been um, passionate about call centers and contact centers um, way back since the early 70s. And uh, to this day, at age 71, I'm still passionate and, and reach a point now where I wish to share as much information as possible with as many people as possible going forward. So that said, let's take a quick look at what we'll be looking at today in session one. World-class contact centers, we'll be discussing that. We'll look into what does the future hold, and I'm quite sure that particularly in the crisis that we are facing now with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, how we move forward as an industry, how we move forward developing world-class customer experience is certainly a top of mind um, topic for everybody. But going forward, I said this is our pilot, so we'll be doing session one today, and in the not too distant future, in association with the Contact Centre Association in Zimbabwe, we'll be developing the other modules as we go along. Down here on the right hand side, you'll see these are full workshops designing World Class IVR and lends into self service models. And then we'll also have another workshop on developing the digital migration. So that gives a broad overview of what we'll be discussing today. It'll probably take us about an hour and a half um, to cover all of the content that we have in those first three modules. So without further ado, let's take a look at it. And this is a, a fundamental principle that I firmly believe in, is that a key strategic imperative is management knowledge. So as much information and knowledge that you can gather or that I can share with you, um, that puts your organization in a better position to be competitive, to retain customers, and otherwise to be a, a more effective and efficient organization. So what we are doing today is sharing that information and knowledge. And you will also note that um, over the years, and, and I've been doing masterclass for about 16 years now, we've had 120 seminars and about 5,000 people have passed through it. And until fairly recently, I've not classified masterclass as training, but rather as knowledge and information sharing. However, my colleague Carrie sitting, watching us very carefully, will be helping us develop these programs into true um, training and measurable outcomes exercises. Thought leadership. We hear the term so often, but there's a very succinct definition of what thought leadership is. An organization or a person who's recognized amongst the peers and mentors, innovative ideas and demonstrates confidence to promote and share those ideas as actionable distilled insights. So what that's really saying is that any organization should aspire to be seen as a thought leader in their particular segment, whether you're in insurance or you're in banking or in um, car hire or courier services, the organization that comes out on top that people think of first off is that organization that is considered to be a thought leader in its particular segment. Individuals who are trusted advisors, as you can see, there's rather long definitions there. Uh, but basically, a trusted advisor within an organization is the go to person when the CEO or the managing director is sitting in the boardroom and, for example, the subject of call centers come up, um, the go-to person is that person that the organization recognizes as the subject matter expert. And uh, so the more information, the more knowledge, the more skills that those individuals have, the more they'll be treated as those trusted advisors. This is a very important component of uh, developing your own career path is become that trusted advisor, become that person with the knowledge and the skill 
that other people don't have. So this is all setting the framework for where we're going in this discussion. Now, many of you who have been on my masterclasses will know this slide very well. Um, I use it a lot to punctuate um, many of the principles that we discuss and uh, share in these models. Key operational challenges. Anyone in customer service, particularly in call center and CX delivery, will truly understand these key operational challenges. These are the uh, things that make us get up in the morning, and these are the things that keep us awake at night. And they also, the words, you can almost hear them echoing from the, from the boardroom, or as the executives in the boardroom grapple with the realities of business today. And that is reduce the cost of operations. Uh, particularly in call centers, we are seen to be inefficient and highly expensive in terms of technology, in terms of people, etc. So a lot of what we do in the Masterclass series is to look for ways and means to reduce those costs of operations. And going hand in glove with that is anything and everything that we can do to increase operational efficiencies. Sometimes it's technology, sometimes it's training, sometimes it's processes, but these are the realities that we need to wrestle with. The third component is all about the money. The boardroom only really understands ka-ching, 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 the sound of money. So in that space, we talk about market share, we talk about revenue generation, upsells, cross-sells, um, customer retention, anything that has an impact on the organization's ability to generate revenue, to retain revenue, increase profits, and increase stakeholder value. So that third component, very, very important. And as we go on to other modules within the Masterclass series, I'll show you how we can build costing models, how we can really start understanding the cost implications of the contact center. Now we have reduced risk. So yes, financial risk is one of the key components of risk, but nowadays, thanks to social media and the way the customers have evolved into more demanding and uh, less tolerant, we have the risk of brand and reputation. And much of that comes back to our contact center. When you think about a contact center agent could handle 15 to 20,000 customer engagements a year. And uh, with every call, our brand and our product and the reputation of our organization is in their hands. And it's what they say and it's how they handle those customers. So managing and mitigating business risk is a key component of what we do in customer engagement centers or contact centers. And then by no means last, or least, shall I say, increase customer satisfaction. That is one of our key drivers is to in, enhance and ensure the highest possible level of customer engagement and customer experience. So in other modules, we'll be discussing how we measure customer experience um, across touch points such as um, customer satisfaction surveys, um, customer effort, scores, um, net promoter index, and there are many other ways in which uh, we can manage, monitor, and control um, customer satisfaction. So those are the things that we need to do. However, there's a reality out there. We know budgets are being cut. We know that expenditure is being cut, and particularly in the realities of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, our job at the same time is to do a lot more with a lot less in the way of resources. So uh, the pressure is on us. And then last but not least on this slide, without compromising quality. So we need to achieve all of those criteria uh, with a lot less in the way of resources, whether it is technology or people, and at the same time, without compromising in any way whatsoever the, the quality component of it. So um, I'll ask you to just dwell for a few moments on that slide. I have a number of clients who have printed out that slide. They put it up in frames in their offices, in their call centers, because when it comes to push, come to shove, that's what we do. And that's what, if we're running a world-class contact center, 
we do all of those very, very well. So moving on to the next slide here, which is really just an outline of what we'll be discussing in session one, part one. So there are three parts to this morning's uh, webinar, and we'll delve right into world-class contact centers. So generally speaking, when I stand in front of a room full of delegates, uh, and we kick off our world-class contact centers, um, I ask around the room, who would like to have a world-class contact center? And of course, all the hands go up as everybody claims they would like to have a world-class contact center. I then say, are you quite sure about that? Because to be a world-class contact center is not easy. It is extremely difficult. And so we're going to take our first steps into understanding what is a world-class contact center. And in other sessions in, uh, that we'll be running later on, maybe next month, we'll start unpacking each of the components that make up the world-class contact center. So let's have a look at this little diagram. Now this model has been developed, as you can see from the slide down here, in 2006 we developed it. And this basically says, what is a world-class contact center and what is the journey um, up this horizontal scale, which you might be able to see here. So it's a matter of the balance between the integration and the operational maturity of the contact center and the strategic alignment of the contact center. Please bear in mind that the contact center is always there to support the strategic and tactical object, um, objectives of the organization. In other words, the boardroom. We are not the tail that wags the dog. We are there to move and to develop our operations in support of the strategic intent of the organization. So down on the bottom there, we see a foundational. Now foundational is the beginning of the life cycle of a contact center. And it doesn't really matter how much money we spend and how much technology we have and how many brilliant people we have, the day that the chairman comes down and ceremoniously cuts the ribbon and officially opens our new brand new call center and makes long speeches, we are still a foundational call center, no matter how much money we've spent. As the time goes by, and it can be accelerated, uh, we become a fundamental contact center. And going further, we move into the developing phase and we start maturing. Now, generally speaking, people say, well, how long is that, does it take to get there? Well, um, with the best will in the world and with all the resources available to, from a foundational open from starting out to reaching mature, is very difficult to do it in less than three or four years. And some might even take even longer to get there. But this is a, a well-run, well-managed, uh, financially viable contact center. And one shouldn't be too concerned about going to the next level, which is our world-class call center. And I'll break down in the next few slides how we approach this and how we measure it. And in fact, the very last module, not in today's session, but in the masterclass series, we go into the, the methodologies used to audit and to measure and to report on the progress we're making on this journey from foundational, moving all the way up to, to world class. So uh, dwell for a moment on that particular slide and uh, ask oneself one's own question is, so where is your organization on the scale? Are you a fundamental basic services contact center? Um, do you, have you progressed a bit beyond that? But you're starting to deploy omni-channel and alternative channels, text perhaps, uh, SMS, or WhatsApp messaging, or are you stabilized and uh, well-run, well-managed, and nobody's really complaining about it? And we'll show you how we do these measurements shortly. So the question we must ask is, where are you on that scale? So what does it take to be a world-class contact center? Let's take a look at this now as we move along. Um, strategic alignment, first off. 
And that means that the contact center must be 100% aligned with the strategic goals and objectives of the organization itself. And uh, I'll drill down a little bit further into that as to how do we make sure that we have strategic alignment. I think the question we have to ask here is how close is the communication links between the operations of the call center and the executives at the highest possible level in the organization? Is it day-to-day -day contact? Uh, is the senior executive, the CEO, aware of the challenges, the problems, the successes that we have in the call center? Or is it a distant uh, reporting chain? But we'll come back to that one shortly. Secondly, our contact center must comply with various standards and KPIs. Once again, I'll unpack that shortly because this is the difficult part. This is very difficult. But that's what um, we're here to help with. And we have a lot of tools and we have a lot of templates and, and information to assist with any organization to develop this compliance with these standards and to maintain certain KPIs which uh, drive the performance of the organization. Thirdly, benchmark. Um, what we often say is we don't know where we are until we know where we are. So how do we know how good we are or how bad we are or how ugly we are until we can benchmark our operation against others? So there are three components of a world-class contact center, uh, the broad brush strokes of it. So let's start unpacking that now. Strategic alignment. Go back to that one. So we say aligned and integrated strategies, aligned with and supported the organization's core business strategies and operations. And so if you have a look up here on the right-hand side, you'll see that uh, we have mission, objectives, tactics, and strategies. So this would be the, the organization itself. And, and it's a question I sometimes ask of call center managers, is that do you have access to the company or the organization's annual report? And second part of the question is, have you read it? Have you questioned it? Have you engaged with senior executives on this question? Um, do the executives understand your realities and do you understand the realities of the, of the boardroom? So critical that we have a line of communication between our operation and the boardroom. This is this part which I mentioned is the difficult component, compliance with standards and KPIs. Let's talk, take a look at it there. So operationally, it meaning the contact center, effectively monitors and meets with specific and clearly specified standards. Right, what are these standards? Well, first we must start with um, a list of our own standards. So we're saying that the contact center must achieve a better than 85% compliance. That's when an independent auditor carries out an audit. Specified standards as defined by the organization. Now this is an important point because it's up to the organization itself to have a lot of standards and objectives and documentation and processes about the way it does business. In other words, it's a it's a schedule of standards and KPIs that uh, the organization itself has demanded of the contact center to deliver on. So we need to start with that. And we have some tools which I'll show you just now uh, to assist with putting these lists of standards together. The second component is internal and external customer expectations. So first and foremost, if our contact center works, for example, with sales and marketing and distribution and retail and various other business units uh, within the organization, what are the expectations of the managers of those business units of our contact center? So it begs the question once again about the efficiency of the communication links between our contact center 
and the heads of departments or heads of business units in the rest of the organization. What do they expect us in the call center to do? Then, of course, the external customer. Um, the customer who's a banking account holder or a savings account holder or a credit card holder or a mobile phone subscriber. What do they really expect? And one of the tragedies that we see in contact centers is that many contact center executives and managers make a lot of assumptions about what customers expect. Um, instead of going out into the, into the uh, consumer environment and carrying out uh, focus um, interviews, face-to-face um, -face interviews, customer satisfaction feedback surveys, focus groups by inviting groups of customers, depending on their segment, into your organization and actually asking them, what is it that you expect us to deliver on? Very important to do that, not only with our own customers, but really important to also to carry out those type of surveys with our competitors' customers and our non-customers, so that we know how to start modifying and tweaking our value proposition, our service offerings, um, to be aligned with those customer expectations going forward. So that's the second component of uh, compliance with those standards. So it's uh, internal um, expectations as well as external. Then of course, specific industries. We have statutory, regulatory um, requirements. If we're in the financial services world, we have uh, the regulator looking at very carefully at what we're doing. If we're in the mobile phone business, telecommunications, we have regulators. Um, we have co the country's laws um, governing certain things. We have the uh, customer protection legislation, for example. Uh, so all of these need to be taken into account. And these also make up specific standards that our contact center would have to maintain going forward. So we need to also drill down very carefully and have a look at those standards and we need to document them. Depending on where we are in the world here in South Africa, we have the SABS, South African Bureau of Standards. We have uh, around about two and a half thousand different call center standards, which I'll share with you in a few moments. And then, of course, we have ISO International, um, which uh, a few years ago um, published the international or global standards. Then there are other standards bodies. Uh, if you're in the outsourcing business, you might have heard of COPC, which is another American-based contact center standard. So if we pause on those compliance with standards as a KPI, as a second component of a world-class call center, as an organization, we need to start developing documentation which clearly specifies what those standards and KPIs are our, our contact center will be expected to run on. So I'll pause briefly on that one and allow that to, to settle in. And so uh, this is where you also have a second chance to say, no, I've changed my mind. I don't want to be a world-class call center. It's too difficult. On the other hand, you can put up your hand and say, let's do it. Let's build ourselves a world-class contact center. Right. Then let's go on to another dimension of standards and KPIs, which I'll share with you here as well. So we do have the South African national standards, which are a body of around 70 of us uh, were consultants. We were appointed by the government way back in 2005 to 2007, roughly, uh, to sit and workshop and write these um, operational standards. So we have um, standards for outbound contact centers, we have standards for inbound contact centers, and we have standards for back office. Now these are well worth having on file. I'm not suggesting for a moment that every call center uses all of those standards, but it's a framework. And it's a, it's a list of standards that you can cherry pick and decide for your own organization what is the most appropriate and uh, uh, which ones of those standards we should apply. Then over here you ha have your ISO international standards. Uh, they're a lot less prescriptive 
than the SABS standards. They're guidelines. They're guidelines to how an organization should go about setting up um, policies, processes, procedures, um, KPIs, measurements, as its frameworks for reporting. So once again, um, customer contact centers, inbound, outbound, and essentially focusing on customer service. Down here, uh, you will see the Dubai model office contact center standards. Well, Dubai, as you might know, um, tries to be the best at everything in the world, including call centers. And um, I had the privilege last year of being invited by the Dubai government, um, along with a colleague, or two colleagues, and we spent a month in Dubai auditing and assessing government contact centers. There are about 45 contact centers in Dubai running government services from hospitals and transport and taxis and you name it. There's a call center, um, government owned and operated call center running customer services. But in my opinion, the standards as set by the Dubai government through their Dubai model office um, are amongst the very best in the world. And they are very uh, well defined. They're easy to understand in the context of imp implementing them within the contact center. And they are relatively easy to audit as well. So there's another set of standards. So those, those other standards, you can get them online, but uh, talk nicely to Timothy. He might just have a copy of these available. And then down here, over the years, I've uh, accumulated uh, 480 KPIs for your call center. And once again, I don't suggest for a moment that you use all 480. Um, this is a work in progress. So um, spreadsheets available. And if you, are, if you are nice to Timothy, he might make a copy of that available to you as well. And then um, definitely free, it's available on my website, uh, is a little ebook that I've written top KPIs for your contact center. And here I picked out, I think it's 15 of what in my opinion are the most important KPIs for just about any call center. So you can download that book off my website uh, free of charge and uh, hopefully you'll get some good value out of it. Uh, just out of interest, that is one of, I think I've done my 10th or 12th book now, uh, which is available on the website. Then, they're easy reading with 10 or 20 pages um, and you feel free to download them and um, distribute them as widely as possible. So there are the tools that you're going to need to start building your own um, set of operational standards for your call center. I said, bear in mind, you're going to need a lot of organizational expectations as well. So, the third component, now that we've set our benchmarks and our, you know, set our standards rather, we've defined them, we've defined our KPIs, we've defined um, the parameters that we are uh, able to monitor ourselves in and the flexibilities that we might have, and now we need to start benchmarking. So the first thing we need to do, if we're a bank, we need to know is are we good or are we bad or how do we rank up? Um, against other other banking um, contact centers. So let's have a look at that now as we look at the benchmarking. So we say a, bench, a contact center should be benchmarked at least on an annual basis. And this is where it starts getting difficult against national, regional and international same sector. So I'll use the bank once again as a as an example, and I see we have a number of banks um, joining us today with delegations. So uh, you would need to, for example, Bank ABC, you would need to benchmark yourself against NB, NMB Bank or any other bank for that matter. Are you better? Are you same? In which areas are you better? Where are you, where are you still needing some work done on it? Then we need to look at regional, which I think would start taking South Africa into account. So we would measure ourselves against the Zimbabwean standards and, and, and norms, and then against the regional or Southern African. 
and then uh, we would reach out and start measuring ourselves against um, international. Now, there are some uh, research reports that are available. Some of them are free of charge. Uh, the one that I strongly recommend is the, it used to be called the Dimension Data, a global benchmark study. Um, that went on for 19 years under the Dimension Data brand. And Dimension Data was recently, well, re about five years ago, acquired by the um, a Japanese telecommunications group, NTT. So that report is now available as the NTT Global Benchmark Study. Um, if you need to buy it, it's ridiculously expensive. It's about uh, $2,000 US. But if you run a call center and you participate in their annual survey, you get a free copy of that research report. And that gives us those international um, benchmarks. And in many cases, it will tell you those benchmarks in the context of the verticals, whether you're in financial services, insurances, retail, et cetera. So I urge you to get a copy of that. And by participating in the annual survey, if you've got a call center, they'll welcome your participation. Then, of course, we have the last piece of that, which is <clears throat> your call center to be classified as world class must achieve at least an 85% compliance score against those key performance indicators that are internationally recognized to comprise best practice. So there are many lists of these uh, best practice guidelines and you'll find them in my books as well. And um, the lists of those standards, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they're in those 480 KPIs, etc. But this means an independent external audit needs to be done and you need to get those scores of 85 compliance uh, against that. So assuming that you achieve um, all three of those, in other words, alignment, adherence to standards, and to carry out your benchmark, then you would certainly be able to qualify as a world-class contact center. Here's another book which you're most welcome to download, um, published in August. And this is a whole booklet on exactly how to go about um, assessing, auditing, and benchmarking your call center. This is the, the do-it-yourself guidelines on how to do it. Um, and uh, if necessary, you can have an external auditor come and do it for you. But that does tend to cost a lot of money. But uh, this, if you have the resources internally, there's no reason why we can't, uh, you can't, uh, run these type of audits yourself. Right, so feel free to download that. You will find it on my website and I'll give you details of that when we, uh, when we finish this particular session. So we'll pause at this point here and uh, allow just that first to settle in. So in summary, we've defined now what a world-class contact center is. Um, I've given you access to the materials that will help you define your operational standards, your KPIs, and the methodologies for monitoring that and recording it and reporting on it. And then finally, the methodologies for doing a self-audit or self-assessment. Right, as we move now to part two of session one, customer interaction centers of tomorrow. So you'll notice that uh, we've moved away from call center, which tended to be uh, merely a definition of operation taking telephone calls and we mo then move to contact center and uh, what with omni channel in other words telephone email text messaging etc we moved into the omni channel or customer interaction center so um, watch this space it's, it's becoming fairly widely recognized as a term of reference so let's have a look into what will that interaction center of tomorrow look like? Well, obviously there are regional differences. There are differences depending on the type of organization, uh, very much differences around what customers are expecting. And so there's no hard and fast rule, but uh, these are some guidelines we need to look at. And so just as a prelude to that, there are three key words that we just need to dwell on for a moment. 
and that is the hindsight, foresight, and insight. So those three components of um, taking a blueprint of a world-class contact center and driving it forward. So hindsight, let's have a look at that first off. Understanding a situation often long after it happened. So I have a number of examples of hindsight in my life. Um, the one which really hurts me is an little anecdotal story here, but it underpins it. A uh, good few years ago, and I must say, must be seven or eight years ago, I had a call from a friend of mine who uh, had traveled a lot and worked in South Africa in the call center industry. And uh, he was an Indian gentleman, and he was then back home in India at the time. And he actually called me and he said, um, have you got uh, $500 to invest? And I said, uh, like, what do you mean $500 invest? I said, I've got this investment that uh, will make you a millionaire and you'll retire very early. And all it needs is $500. No, I mean, I can't, can't afford that. And besides, it sounds too good to be true. Anyway, I went on and he insisted. And uh, I said, no. Anyway, um, if I look back to, I think it, in the peak was 2018, December. My $500, if I'd bought Bitcoins in uh, that time, would have been worth something like $20 million. It was just ridiculous. So there's a fine example of hindsight, understanding a situation long after it happened. So my $500 could have been a very lucrative investment. Then, of course, the foresight is the ability to predict what will happen in the future. So uh, let's face it, nobody or very few people had the foresight to predict the impact of COVID-19. Ironically, though, in a series of interviews that I've been doing, and you might wish to, to um, listen to them, I've done 26 interviews with key people in our organization, uh, in our industry from around the world. Um, and I've, I've been interviewing them on the impact of COVID-19. There are two or three organizations, believe it or not, actually had um, viral type uh, pandemics in their disaster recovery plans. And as such, when they first started seeing the impact of COVID in emerging out of China, these organizations started implementing their disaster recovery plans and uh, they've thrived as a consequence of that. So that is the foresight, the ability to, to see what's needed in the future. And that's where these masterclass seminars, I try to give the knowledge and the information that allows organizations to make astute decisions moving forward. And then there's insight, gain an accurate and deep understanding of something. So once again, sharing knowledge and information and uh, research data about call centers and contact centers um, is a way in which the organization and you as individuals can have that insight into where the future lies. So let's take a, a stroll into what happens when we have a combination of foresight and insight moving forward. Well, bottom line is we have what's becoming known in business circles as this disruptive strategies, an organization that can disrupt for example, the way that Uber disrupted the taxi business or that Airbnb disrupted the hotel business. And there are many examples of that for insurance and banking. Um, using technologies, uh, these organizations are being disruptive in the marketplace. And guess what? They are growing exponentially and they are growing their prosperity as, and um, value to stakeholders uh, at an exponential rate. So. What we're trying to achieve here then is the combination of using knowledge and expertise and technology um, to allow an organization to catapult itself into new levels of excellence. Right, let's take a look at some of the very real economic drivers taking place in our industry. What this slide is actually showing is that and I'll expand on that in the next few slides as well. As customers are realizing that call centers and contact centers are becoming an important part of their lives, um, we are getting a lot more calls or contacts, telephone calls, emails, 
text messaging, etc. And therefore our headcount is increasing as those calls are going. And along with the headcount increasing, we have cost increases. So the reality is customer experience, customer service is growing exponentially. Our headcount is growing and therefore the costs associated with our growing. So that's our first component. We have some severe pressure from um, a point of view of the economics of it. And I'll pop this slide in here. It comes from um, a Gartner conference in the UK that I was at in 2017. And it's just a very important note that we should all take cognizance of about the cost of servicing customers. In another lecture or a seminar module, we'll discuss how we measure uh, and how we calculate, in fact, the cost to serve. But take a look at this here. The voice channel, good old telephone, as much as it is applicable to sales, service, information, complaints, faults, etc., it is by far the most expensive channel to communicate on. Uh, it's because of the technology, it's because of the time that it takes, uh, because of the skills required, um, etc. Um, video chat, which is starting in some regions, co-browsing, live chat, email, and all the way down here, the lowest and cheapest form of self-service is uh, web frequently asked questions or self-service. And here's IVR. So we need to look very carefully at this this cost to serve, and it's based on the highest probability, probability of achieving that magic holy grail of first contact resolution that we all strive to achieve in contact centers. So let's just bear in mind those economic drivers which are pushing volumes up are also pushing costs up. Our job as uh, strategic advisors, if you like, in contact centers is to find ways of achieving high levels of customer satisfaction across all of these portals um, or components at the lowest possible cost. So um, uh, that's worth, worth bearing in mind that. So more primary business drivers, money, 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 money. It costs money. And contact centers generally are seen by organizational executives as expensive cost centers in terms of the technology that we need, in terms of the headcounts that we need. And it's been very, very difficult to prove our value to the organization. And that becomes one of the big challenges and one of the things we stress during the Masterclass series is um, how do we drive ourselves from being a cost center into a value center where we're starting to demonstrate to the organization that we are an essential part of that organization. We're a valuable component of the organization's business mix, and we are contributors to the success of that organization, and in particular to the financial component. And ultimately, that's where we want to be, to be able to see as an important contributor to the profits of the organizations. No longer a cost center, but certainly a profit center. So there are some organizations have managed to do this uh, essentially by driving themselves out of a pure customer service environment into a sales environment. Because let's face it, it's a lot easier to measure profitability or contribution in a sales environment than it is to show um, our value in terms of delivering customer service and, for example, maintaining high levels of customer retention and customer loyalty. So we need to just keep an eye on that. that uh, this is, I think, um, an important component of any um, business plan for a contact center is to have that journey mapped out, that migration over a period of time from a cost center through the value center and ultimately to be up as the a key component of profit center. Customer demographics. Yes, um, I should really put a photograph of myself up there in the top corner because demographics are changing from the baby boomers, which is my generation, to the, um, the wide gens down here, the new millennials coming through. 
customers are changing and their habits are changing and wants, needs, desires, expectations are changing. And so it's important that as contact center operators and as businesses, we are moving with those changes in the demographics and understanding them and delivering products and services and communication channels um, in accordance with those customer expectations. Um, let's face it, in my generation, there are still many customers out there that expect postal service with their bank statements and they expect to be able to write a letter to their organization and they expect a response in the same channel. There are not many left, but uh, it's a reality. Whereas uh, we do know our millennials, their first point of contact is their mobile phone. And uh, if it's not on a mobile phone, then uh, they don't want to do business with us. Market drivers, what's happening out there in the market space? Well, I mentioned smartphones. Well, the take up of smartphones, particularly across Africa, is growing exponentially. And it's, uh, it's quite frightening to see the per capita distribution of smartphones uh, in even emerging markets coming through. And so the impact of smartphone penetration is having a radical impact on our service delivery capabilities. And as I mentioned, the insight, where is this going? What is the penetration of smartphones likely to be in the next year, in the next two years, the next five years. Um, that's the, the value of insight, is predicting um, with accuracy where that's going. And of course, the introduction of smartphones means digital channels, they go hand in glove. The minute we have a smartphone, we have all the social channels, we have WhatsApp, WhatsApp video, we have uh, Messenger, Facebook Messenger, we have text messaging, um, and email, et cetera, et cetera. We have apps, which have, many have their own communication channels. And so if we predict accurately the penetration, take up and utilization of smartphones, that's a very clear indicator of how we start mapping our digital migration and our digital journey going forward. Customer attitudes and expectations. And it's a pity I can't see the delegates sitting in on this session. I see we have 34 delegates. Thank you. Um, because this is where we see heads nodding in agreement. I like when people agree with what I have to say in my theories. So number one, I'm quite sure you'll agree that customers in general have far greater expectations of us as an organization and particularly in the customer service environment. Um, they're less tolerant and definitely more demanding. Um, so, uh, you know, that's something we, I think every one of us in this profession knows firsthand. An interesting one here is all the research is pointing to the fact that many of our customers are more informed than our call center agents. Uh, before calling a company, for example, or a bank, many of them have been online and have done their research and have engaged with other organizations and they know down to the last detail the features benefits and advantages of our products and services and our competitors so it's something we need to be very careful of and this points to um, something we'll discuss in other sessions is building knowledge management systems and knowledge sharing systems and cooperation systems to allow for um, dissemination of information to our, our people, to put our people into the more informed space. More digital, as we mentioned earlier, and this is the other one, instant gratification. I want it now. I don't want to apply for, let's say, a, a surrender on insurance policy to be told that uh, it would take three to four weeks to get it done. Um, they want it and they want it now. If they call and they want to balance over an account, they want that information now. They don't want to hear what we used to do in the old days, uh, I'll call you back or please call me in a week or whatever it is. So instant gratification is a hallmark of the modern customer. Those same customers are demanding self-service. They are being exposed to self-service channels. They're being exposed to our competitors perhaps having apps um, that have access into your accounts and 
allow transfers between accounts, et cetera. So that self-service channel, there's huge pressure on organizations to make high quality customer services available through the self-service channels. So what does the future hold? And as we kind of look into that murky crystal ball, which has been made even more murky with uh, the impact of COVID on our entire world, but uh, we can start looking at some global trends. Now bear in mind that these global trends is a report that I do every three to six months. So this is the state of the world pre-COVID. So, uh, in March, which was my last visit to your beautiful country, uh, I think it was the 16th of March, 15th, 16th of March, I was there. Um, and COVID was just something happening in, a, in the distance. But uh, the research was uh, pre-COVID. I'll, I'll bring you up to speed uh, shortly with some slides I added this morning on where COVID is in that impacting us. So the future, top 12 global trends, what, driving our industry. So let's have a look at them as we go through slowly. So these are impacting on the ability of organizations to deliver high quality customer experience. So no surprise, number one agenda item when executives throughout the world across all sorts of verticals were interviewed, uh, what came out on top managing the customer experience. So this is something we need to take into account. We need to take uh, very, very seriously. The focus of our energies and efforts um, has to be in the managing the customer experience space. This one was uh, not too surprising, but um, two years, three years ago, when we started doing this survey, quality management was about number four or number five. So in recent times, quality management and quality assurance methods has risen to the second most important priority in terms of how these things are impacting on customer experience. And I think it just goes to, you know, it's fairly logical that uh, managing the customer experience and quality management and quality assurance uh, are right next to each other. They go hand in glove. Staff engagement and workforce optimization. Uh, once again, not really surprising, but uh, until six months ago, a year ago, it was fairly low down the scale. What's driving that up is that any which way we run uh, costing models against our call centers, the cost of our workforce um, will constitute between 70 and it could be as high as 80% of our operational costs in a call center. So as our costs increase through inflation, through the number of head count that we have to have, et cetera, um, there's more and more focus on how do we optimize that workforce? How do we get more efficiency, more passion, more engagement out of the staff? How do we make sure that we've got the right number of staff, we're not overstaffed, we're not understaffed? And that is the whole art and science of um, workforce optimization that we will discuss in greater detail in uh, future seminars as well going forward. Number four, a few years ago, uh, it was almost uh, prohibitive to have process automation in our call centers. It was only the realm of the very big international organizations that had the budgets and the wherewithal to invest in these types of technologies. However, we are now seeing that even in uh, fairly entry-level omni-channel contact center technologies, there's a great deal of low-cost, easy-to-implement um, process automation tools and remote, robotic process automation. So it's another subject when we discuss it in another workshop on digital migration and self-service on how we leverage these technologies um, to deliver high quality customer experience on the one hand um, whilst reducing costs on, on the other. Analytics, data analytics. Um, for many of us, we've grown up and we still run many of our aspects of our organization on Excel. And for those who've done the courses and have become proficient with Excel, you'll know that even within good old Excel, a number of 
functions that can be automated. Uh, particularly if we start integrating that with the certain CRM tools that we have, but more and more we're seeing the power of data analytics and we're seeing the cost of analytics um, diminishing and the, let's call it the, the new skill set of the data analyst who's looking deeper and deeper and deeper into that, uh, those spreadsheets, those reports, those other tools and starting to understand customer behavior, and in some areas even able to have what we call predictive analytics, where we know in advance, and there's that insight to going where something is going to happen. Uh, for example, in the mobile phone industry, there's a lot of work done where contact centers are able to accurately, very accurately predict when customers are most likely to churn and go to the competitors. So interaction analytics becomes really, really important. And I'm, I'm uh, doing a lot of work in South Africa at the moment in the area of speech analytics. And uh, that is already proving to show that um, we can use technology to monitor 100% of all calls in and out of call centers. Um, I'm not so sure about uh, the utilization of this technology in the Zimbabwean environment because it's specific to language groups and the, the South African language uh, library took 15 years for a team of scientists to build. So um, we'll see how that progresses going forward. But the interaction analytics become a very important component of what we do and what we should be doing in the contact center. Social media integration, I think many organizations have uh, reached the realization that uh, particularly the younger generation are um, taking on the social media as their primary source of communication. So whether it is uh, text messaging, such as uh, WhatsApp, uh, voice messaging, it's uh, Facebook Messenger, it's all those other channels uh, that need to be integrated into our core systems in our contact centers because uh, this is how the customer of the future will uh, prefer to engage with us will be through those social media channels there's a lot of evidence to support that going forward and our next one digital migration and we discussed uh, and i'll expand on it uh, shortly the omni channel but basically the omni channel uh, term or phrase is that uh, we started out as mono-channel with telephones in the good old days of call centers. Um, then we had email and we had faxes in those days as well. And this was really what we call, would have called then um, a, a multi-channel environment. Um, even many call centers today will treat voice, in other words, telephony, email, text messaging, um, written correspondence, walk-in, these are all um, kind of standalone channels. Um, to some extent, we can look at how they've been uh, integrated, but the omni-channel, and I'll show a slide in a few moments, is a, a philosophy that says a customer can communicate with us across any channel at any time and always receive consistently exactly the same level of service um, from an agent. I'll expand on that shortly, but uh, this is a big driver and it's driving uh, the need to relook at our call center platforms and our technologies. So on the one hand, we look at data analytics and the other is we start looking at the, the next level of that machine learning and um, AI, the two going hand in, in glove as uh, the systems become smarter and we have um, artificial intelligence really driving a lot of the processes behind what we do in the call center. Um, now, if we take those two together, for example, um, AI in the call center and omnichannel, it's pointing some of the systems that we're using today. For example, if a customer has called into the call center and had a successful engagement with, a, with an agent, and uh, the QA scores are consistent with that. The next time that that customer calls the call center, that call will be automatically routed 
to that particular agent. And that's where we're starting to use that technology to create what I call the, the customer wow experiences. Hybrid outsourcing, and, and it's interesting to see, and I'm glad to see that we've got some um, delegates from um, OmniContact in Zimbabwe, outsourcing, and there's a, a lot of interest in outsourcing, but um, it, I say it's, out, it's um, become a hybrid. So 10 years ago, outsourcing was all about how many dollars per agent per month, uh, per seat, if you like, and today's outsourcing model is more around business outcomes and measurable outcomes um, in the outsourcing relationship. It's also a much tighter partnership rather than a contractual distance. Proactive and outbound, uh, more and more organizations are realizing that they have a wealth of uh, information and data about the existing customers and that a great deal of an incremental revenue and profit can be generated by being more proactive with existing customers. Um, and therefore, outbound telemarketing becomes a, a key to delivering enhanced customer experience at the same time as generating revenue. We also have in certain parts of the world more and more legislation prohibiting um, tele telephonic or any other form of contact uh, without permission. So there's a scramble in many cases to uh, initiate contact with customers proactively and to get what's called opt-in. In other words, their permission to communicate with them on a fairly regular basis. And this, of course, becomes the key to incremental revenue through upsell and cross-sell of our additional products and services. And so if we're doing our homework and we are analyzing our data and we're starting to develop profiles on our customers, uh, we should have a much better chance of doing a very effective upsells and cross-sells and into our existing customer base. Data security. Now, I want you just to look very carefully at this because it's now number 11. Now, bearing in mind that this survey was done about six months before COVID and amongst uh, senior executives of many different organizations. So data security and protection of personal information was not seen to be very important six months ago. In a few slides from now, I'll show you how important it has become going forward. So data security. And last but not least, we're still seeing tremendous growth in public sector contact centers. As um, municipalities and public sector bodies and government departments are, are starting to appreciate the value that a call center or a contact center can bring to the organization. Um, so there's a great level of interest coming up from the public sector. So there are the 12 global trends that were impacting um, on the CX environment. And as I mentioned, COVID has changed a lot of that. And so, 25th of May, a few days ago, I connected with a good friend and colleague of mine, Peter Ryan, who's based in Canada, and is recognized internationally as one of the industry's most respected analysts. And uh, so, we've been engaging on a series of webinars uh, around the COVID, impact of COVID. And so I um, asked him for a few slides, which he sent me yesterday, and uh, I've just integrated these into our slide deck today. So uh, essentially, when he was looking at uh, the, the BPO and the outsourcing um, industry, uncertainty in the offshore, um, nobody really knows what is going to happen elsewhere in the world. So we are tending to focus on our internals. And, Upheavals in customer experience. I'm quite sure that you're feeling it in Zoom just as much as we're feeling it here. There's no, no nothing's normal anymore. Everything is very different. Um, so upheavals in customer experience. Some people are getting great service, whereas others are suffering because we are uh, work from home agents, etc. So changes in consumer confidence. Um, Customers all over the world are losing confidence in their, in their supplier organizations. Um, 
and in their governments for that matter, and in their own societies. So in the middle of this tsunami of change happening around us. Um, the shift to work to home, this has been a fascinating model to watch because in the space of two months, pretty much well, April, May, uh, three months, um, all over the world, organizations have redeployed their people to work from home. Um, it's been a subject for discussion for many years, but very few organizations have actually done it until COVID accelerated this process um, in the last few months. So for many organizations, the work from home is a brand new business model. Although certain type you know, parts of the world, the return to work, uh, we in SA, from uh, the 1st of June, we're going to level three, which means that another group of people can start going back to work. But we're already starting to see organizations saying, well, the work from home model is very cost effective. We're seeing some interesting statistics about increased productivity, increased levels of customer satisfaction from work from home agents. So um, there are many organizations considering con keeping up the work from home as the basic model going forward. It obviously puts a lot of uh, pressure on technology changes and I've been working with a number of clients who had exactly this crisis of having to move several hundred agents out of the call center into a work from home environment, meaning to uh, secure the laptops and the other technologies, uh, 3G, 4G technology, broadband, and making sure that that works. Um, a lot of the security issues around that have been uh, nightmares for some organizations as well. So. And then that pressure on compliance um, through the work from home model. How do we make sure that our agents are delivering high quality customer service? Uh, can we sit back and still do our one or two calls or five calls per agent per month and assume that they're doing uh, um, complying with all of our requirements? So it's put a lot of pressure on how we redesign that. Um, Hopefully you'll be able to see this particular slide coming up. But uh, this is from Peter Ryan, as you can see there. And he did a survey um, fairly recently, and like uh, six or six weeks ago, um, asking contact center and customer experience executives throughout the world um, to rank in order of importance uh, some of these criteria, in-house contact center pressure points, he calls them. And... Uh, Guess what? Here's that data protection right at the top. So it's showing us that customers throughout the world, almost in the last six or nine months, have um, developed an acute awareness of their rights in terms of data and data security. So this is um, a very important survey telling us to be extremely aware of this customer insight into data protection. Um, also, I found fascinating recruiting the right agents, and particularly as we move into work from home, um, who are the right agents to work from home? Mm, uh, the indicators are that the, the slightly older people, more mature people, are more comfortable as introverts working from home than younger agents. So look at this, agent attrition, all in the top two slots here. Here we see artificial intelligence into customer experience, um, managing customer experience. So they're all in the top tier of these uh, criteria that are governing the customer experience out there. So all these slides as I said, are available in the deck from Timothy after the event. Very small um, fonts here, but uh, nonetheless, for those involved in outsourcing, and this is an interesting one, is um, what are the competitive advantages or offerings in the value proposition of outsources? So this slide is especially for our friends from OmniContact out there. So uh, once again, you can see data protection, compliance requirements, and home-based agents' capabilities as an outsourcer. And then it moves down to some of the others. I won't drill down into a lot of these uh, in detail, but this um, is a blueprint for how 
contact centers considering going into the uh, particularly international outsourcing um, sector um, need to really design their organizations uh, with this in mind. So service-based interactions, and this is where as an industry we've been for, uh, I've been in the industry for nearly 45 years and we, we started out looking at the industry as a service-based interaction, whereas we need to make this journey over to this side of the equation, which is our value-based. So down here we have our call center, the good old fashioned. Um, we developed call centers because it was seen to be cheaper than bricks and mortar. For example, we've seen it in the banking fraternity where the investments have been into call centers on the notion that it's cheaper to run a call center than it is to run a banking hall. Largely transactional. Um, we've been We've been guilty of driving efficiencies before effectiveness. We we drive key performance indicators, for example, like average handling time, and we penalize agents if they go over the average handling time because we're like a factory. We we just want efficiencies. And uh, in the past, we didn't pay too much attention to the customer experience, but that was the the early days. We then moved, oops, too fast. Uh, we moved from there to the contact center where we started looking at multi channels. We started taking emails, text messaging, etc. We started developing an awareness of customer care and started expanding our view into a much more mass market approach using the contact center to gather new information, new knowledge, and new customers. And then, as we mentioned earlier, there's our value and revenue based interactions of the interactive EX support center. There's Omni Channel. Let's we'll just discuss that very briefly. I do expand on it a lot when we get into the technology modules on other sessions. But basically, here we have all the, or some of the various channels from chat and telephone and smartphones with text messaging. Um, emails, etc., video, even video conferencing, video messaging, voice messaging, um, and we have customers. And those customers expect that whoever in they engage with across whichever channel it is, gives them the same consistent uh, answers to whatever queries there may be. And what we're also starting to experience is uh, channel hopping, and I'm guilty of it myself. I might start off with uh, sending a text message to my bank, um, expecting a response on it. I don't get a response. I would then uh, maybe um, make a phone call. And at the same time, I'd send an email and I might send a WhatsApp now. Or, and uh, let's add some of the social channels. Let's add Twitter. Uh, all about the same issue. Um, but the probability is in most organizations, those messages, those communications are going to go to different parts of the organization, different people, different business units. And as a customer, I'm going to get different answers. Whereas if I look at my bank, and I won't tell you which one it is, I just see one bank, whether it is home loans, motor vehicle finance, credit card, whatever it is. And I'm not really interested in how it's segmented into different business units behind the scenes. So I expect the same consistent level of service, irrespective of the, the channel that I come in on. So last generation multi-channel, as I've just explained, we have some very grumpy people other than the one character here in the middle. And there's our last generation different channels into different people within the organization who are all specialists in their particular channels. And next generation, of course, is with all of those communications going to what's called, in simple terms, a single waiting room, and then are routed to the agent, either who has the best skill or is skilled in all of these channels and therefore able to handle them all. So, it's a discussion we'll have when we open up uh, the next uh, webinar, which will be dealing with some of the technologies which are now available. 
you know, one of the things driving it, or the key to all of this, is the artificial intelligence, which is happening in the background that allows the systems to channel these different um, communication elements to the most appropriate resource internally. And a lot of it, more and more, we're going into the self-service environment, which is in this realm. So, 2021, um, this slide is a few years old. We predicted that uh, by 2021, and uh, COVID has impacted this, so let's add a year or two to it. But uh, nonetheless, this is, uh, this is the, the murky crystal ball as we gaze into the future somewhat. So if we were designing a contact center, if we were architects of the future, if we were the trusted advisors reporting into the EXCO and the CEOs asking us, what do we need in the call center? Well, if we looked a few years into the future, 21, 2021, 2022, the answer is that our customers will demand to communicate with us on any device and any channel. So it's no longer just a telephone. They will be demanding 24 by 7, 365 days a year. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we have live agents on call 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, but the customer will be demanding some sort of engagement, whether it is self-service, IVR messaging with callbacks, um, access to information through apps, FAQs, etc. But that would be the expectation. And they're your self-service and self-service portals. So if we are architecting the future, those customers, any device, any time, and ideally, they'll be going into the self-service portals and getting the answers that they want and expect. We've been talking systems integration for the last 20 years. Oops, gone too fast on that one. Um, and we have legacy systems. I hate that term, but it's for real. And in some organizations, we still have old mainframes and, and uh, old networks and old systems. And this has been the, the bugger and the bane of many people's lives as we struggle to provide high quality customer service. So going forward, systems integration is no longer on the back burner. It really has to come up into the front and to be part of how we are delivering these services. There's our data analytics that we spoke about, and we call it agile process automation. It's the ability of the operation, the call center operation, to work with, develop, and deploy, and to change very quickly some of the process automation functions that happen in the contact center. Multi-channel chat. And um, there are many parts of the world where chat has overtaken voice communication in the contact centers. And this is something which uh, we're starting to see rolling out in certain parts of, of Africa. In Kenya, for example, um, chat in many respects is far greater in terms of volume than um, voice communications. In UK, also, we're starting to see more voice, more chat than we're seeing voice. Voice biometrics and speech analytics, I touched on that earlier. Now, voice biometrics is the ability to identify unique um, human voices, and that's used for access, verification, uh, proof of life, etc. Speech analytics is using words and phrases and understanding through technology uh, the composition and the transcription of um, communication and, and uh, conversations with customers. And uh, intelligent knowledge management, I touched on that earlier, that uh, it's becoming more and more imperative that everybody in our contact center, agents, uh, supervisors, team leaders, um, have a consistent flow of updated and easy to access knowledge around the products and the services, organizational changes, policy changes, process changes, etc. So many tools are available now that, uh, that allow that to happen. And then there's your omni-channel that we spoke about earlier. The ability to communicate across all of those channels, uh, depending on the 
um, customers' requirements. So sitting right in the middle of this is, I call her the super agent. Um, and basically what we're saying is that customer out here, when they have tried everything, when they have used the self-service channels, when everything else hasn't resulted in a, a good answer, they want to speak to somebody that I call the super agent, who's not going to refer that to a supervisor, who's not going to have to say, I'll call you back, but as somebody who's empowered by that organization to make these decisions and to make uh, commitments on behalf of the organization. <coughs> Forgive me, I'm gonna tickle in my throat. We're coming up for wrap up in a few moments too. So if we look at, you know, what are these challenges going forward into 21 and beyond? And I won't go through all of those, but uh, as a contact center professional, and particularly if you're working in the technology uh, arena, these are the components, or some of them now, and many more in fact, uh, that we need to look to in planning this digital migration. I do have a full workshop on digital migration, which uh, will put into a virtual form in the not too distant future. So summary and key takeaways of uh, our little session here when we're looking at the contact center of the future. The reality, smartphone penetration is an absolute given. With that comes the opening up of the digital channels. There we see those changes in the customer profile or the demographics of our profile of our customers and their expectations more so changing demographics particularly with the, the x gens coming through now there's our customer interaction center of tomorrow or not too distant future and our omni channel so these are some of the elements that we need to take cognizance of going forward in designing planning budgeting and uh, crafting our contact center of the future. So we say uh, questions and discussion. Uh, by all means, we do have a chat box here, here and a Q&A. So if anybody in particular has a, a question, please pop it into the chat box here and we'll attempt to answer it. Uh, alternatively, please engage with Timothy. You can send him emails which you'll forward to me around any of the topics that we've discussed today and uh, I will gladly respond to them and share that information with, with anybody who is uh, keen to have that information on hand. So, uh, my screen is jammed now, whatever reason. There we go. So basically this is the, the end of our one and a half hour mini um, masterclass. Um, I'd just like to thank my sponsors for this. It's the Alpha Wave Ventures and their Colby Speech Analytics, who uh, very kindly donated the Zoom webinar facilities. And uh, I do hope that everybody has enjoyed the session. Uh, if anybody would like to put their hands up or make any comments, um, we're still experimenting with it, but uh, please put your hand up and we will ask you to come in live. Um, Nobody there yet. And Timothy, are you there? I'm here, Rod. There we go. Timothy, would you like to do a wrap up? Yeah. Okay, just a moment. Hi, Rod. Right, Timothy, let's have some, uh, some last words from you. Timothy, are you with us? I'm here, Rod. I'm just Okay, we're having some technical challenges there. Um, just having a connectivity, let me just sort that out. Uh, 
um, are we? While we're doing that, there has a, a question come in from Tuanda. Uh, what do you suggest are the most effective ways of cost reduction on the modern call center? That's a fascinating question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can, can you hear me now? I can hear you, yes. Sir. Would you like to do a wrap up, Timothy? Okay. You my, my no, that's right. My connectivity has just dropped there. Okay. I was just trying to, to, to work on it. All the same, thank you very much and thank you, Kerry Stevens, for, for, for joining us. Um, the, 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 the pilot project for the upcoming sessions that we have, it might be a bit longer than this one and there will be, hopefully there will be more, there will be more interactive. Hmm. Hello guys, can you get me? Are you, are you hearing me? Yeah, I can hear you. And I think we've lost him yeah. here again. Okay, so, so. Uh, no, we, we seem to have lost him here again. So uh, I think this is where we're just going to, uh, just going to, uh, to hang up now. And um, I thank everybody for giving up the time to, to share with us this morning. And uh, as Timothy said at the outset, this is a, a pilot project. I hope you've all enjoyed it. We're going to ask you in the questionnaire for some feedbacks and any comments or, or suggestions for going forward. Timothy, I think that's it. Okay. Uh, thank, th thank you, Robert. And thank you, everyone. We closed in at uh, 42 participants. And um, I know it, it, it takes a lot of time for you to, to deviate from your busy schedule. Some of you are working from home. Some of you have started working in the office, but uh, thank you so much uh, for being part of this uh, pilot program. Um, I can see some of the questions are still coming in. You can still send them direct to me via email. You can still send them to me direct via email. Uh, then I will also be able to forward them to Rod, then he can respond. Then we are going to post some screenshots of this uh, initial uh, uh, webinar. Then we would like to urge you to go to our page and comment on what we can improve on this one. So at least the one that's come up, maybe in the next 30 days, I know Rod is preparing something for us, which has got more relevance to the, to the pandemic year that we're in. And I think with your valued inputs, we'll be able to improve the quality of, uh, of this uh, webinar. Thank you, Rod. Uh, thank you, Kerry. I'm not uh, take much of your time. Um, and uh, from the guys from, from Zimbabwe, uh, from Bulueyo, uh, thank you. Asava Smart Tech, thank you. Um, uh, PSMI, thank you, ZTTDC. Thank you, uh, Face uh, Capital Bank. Thank you, Bank ABC and, and all those that I cannot mention since it was quite a, a big group. Thank you so much and we hope to hear your comments. You can send your, your, your feedback via email and uh, we'll see you in the next uh, 30 days, maybe three weeks or so, Rod. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay safe.